Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the re remote information session for the Fulbright U.S. Student Program. My name is Alex Sauer and I am the coordinator of scholarship research and career development in the Honors College, but I also serve the entire campus as a fellowship advisor for the National Prestigious Scholarship Program. Um, as a fellowship advisor, it's my job to help connect students um, to different major scholarship and awards and assist them in making the best possible application. So obviously today we're going to talk about the Fulbright U.S. Student Program, um, but I also work with many other awards such as Marshall, Goldwater, Truman, the Rhodes Scholarship, really anything that's nationally and competitive. So if any of these other awards do pique your interest, I do highly recommend that you contact me and, and we can talk about your options. Of course, today we are going to be talking about Fulbright specifically though, and with us we have have, um, Rebecca Shippen, who is our recruiting coordinator for the Honors College. Um, she's going to be on the line and she's going to be helping me to take your questions. So if you do have a question during this presentation, please do not hesitate to type that into the chat box and both Rebecca and I will make sure that your question gets answered as we go along. Okay. So now let's move on to what our plan for the day is. So first I'm going to go over the basics of what the Fulbright U.S. Student Program is, the eligibility requirements, the different awards that are offered through the Fulbright U.S. Student Program, and then some specifics about the application. Now, we're not going to get too into the weeds about the actual application. This is more to give you a general idea about what Fulbright is and maybe help you decide whether or not you want to apply. Then we're going to move on to timelines and deadlines, both those that you can expect from the Fulbright National Competition, as well as here on campus, some different deadlines and timelines to think about. And then we're going to wrap up today talking about Auburn's specific campus process for this application cycle, as well as the different resources that we are planning to have for our applicants um, as we as we progress through the application cycle. We want to make sure you are prepared in every way possible to put forth the best possible application. So that's the plan. But before I go any further, I do want to take a moment to show you a brief video about the Fulbright program. And, and, and so here, without further ado, we're going to start this video. Fulbright is... Fulbright is... Adventurous. An incredible experience. A really key part of American diplomacy. The true purpose of it is to create mutual understanding. It's rigorous. It's what you make of it. Fulbright is this incredible resource. You don't know how much you're capable of until you're put in certain situations. It gets you comfortable with the uncomfortable. It really changes your identity. It gives you a new perspective. I see it as a, a chance to have a big adventure. You embrace those hardships. You make it your own. Fulbright is an academic cultural exchange program. It's for Americans doing study, research, or teaching English for roughly an academic year. I did my Fulbright in a small Pacific Island country called Kiribati. And I went to London. To Malaysia. Belgium. Senegal. Jordan. Cambodia. India. Singapore. The Galapagos and Ecuador. When I went to Trinidad, my research focused on girls in juvenile detention center. Trying to fight hunger and malnutrition in in Ethiopia. Studied high-speed aerodynamics at a small research laboratory outside of Brussels. Focusing on trivalent chromium and type 2 diabetes. Working with researchers to understand the impacts from plastic pollution. Taught fifth through eighth grade students conversational English. The whole point of my project is to create empathy and understanding and respect for Kiribati people. It's a life-changing experience. It's not just your grant year. Fulbright is lifetime. Fulbright is for everyone. So that means that Fulbright is also for you. So like I said, that video is to sort of give you a general idea of what some different Fulbrighters might do. And from there, we're going to move in. For now that we've gone through that, we're going to go into a little bit more detail about what the Fulbright program is and how it was started. So Senator William Fulbright um, created this program. He proposed a bill to use the proceeds from selling uh, surplus US, um, U.S. government war property to fund international exchange between the U.S and other countries. So it, rather than reinvesting that money 
into arms, he decided to create a program to build bridges between communities. Um, it is sponsored by the State Department, has been since the beginning. It's also funded in part by the State Department. Um, it's administered by the International Institute of Education, and its main goal, the main goal of Fulbright, is to increase the mutual understanding between the people of the U.S. and the people of other countries through exchange, and that's one of the things that um, the students in the video were, were sort of highlighting. Um, to quote Senator Fulbright himself, um, the Fulbright program's mission is to bring a little more knowledge, a little more reason, and a little more compassion into world affairs and thereby increase the chance that nations will learn at last to live in peace and friendship. So it's a really cool organization that aims to send people abroad for the purpose of connecting people, for the purpose of really um, facilitating that cultural exchange. So who should apply for a Fulbright? Well, if you're a highly motivated individual who's open-minded and interested in a deeply immersive experience, then Fulbright is right for you. Also, uh, they're looking for candidates that would benefit greatly from cultural exchange and also have the means to contribute themselves to, to some cultural exchange. So to serve as an ambassador for the US in a lot of ways. Um, they want students who have leadership abilities, students that are willing to take initiative and have that um, motivation to really uh, strive for excellence. Um, and they're also looking for people who are flexible, who have um, the mental fortitude and adaptability to be able to spend up to 10 months abroad, which is a really long time. Um, so they're definitely looking for people who are, are um, who are ready to take that plunge and are ready to commit to a very uh, elaborate, immersive experience. So those are the people that should apply. Now, who can apply? Because sometimes this can be a little different. Um, the eligibility for Fulbright is relatively broad, especially when referring to um, major scholarship, national prestigious scholarship. It's eligible to any graduating seniors. So if you are planning to graduate between right now, this semester, and the spring of 2021, then you would be eligible to apply for the first time to Fulbright for the application year that's, that's just started, right? But Fulbright is not just open to uh, graduating seniors, it's also open to recent graduates and even graduate students or even early career professionals. If you've moved on from, from school and started a job, Fulbright is still um, a possibility for you, um, especially those that are like working full time as an artist or a musician. Um, Fulbright is open to all majors, all different degree specialities are welcome. And then the basic eligibility uh, for all Fulbright awards is that you need to be a US citizen, you need to be a US citizen by the application deadline, you need to have your bachelor's degree or equivalent in hand by the start of the grant. Um, most Fulbright grants start in September of the year after you apply, so that would be for this application cycle, September of 2021, um, but some of them start in January or February, so it's possible um, that you could graduate as late as next um, a, a year from, from um, fall, so in the fall of 2021. Um, and if you're applying to grants that are going to begin in the spring of 2022, you'd be eligible because you'd have your bachelor's degree in hand by the time before that grant actually starts. The other major eligibility um, snag is that you cannot have a doctorate at the time that you are, are um, applying. You can be a doctoral student, but you cannot have a doc doctorate degree in hand. There's actually a different Fulbright organization, Fulbright Scholar Program is for um, people who already have their doctorate. And then I've highlighted here that there are a bunch of country specific requirements. So this is the basic eligibility, right? This is the, the bare bones eligibility for all awards, but within the different, the, that, the many different types of awards that um, Fulbright offers, there are a lot of country specific specificities or um, yeah, specific, specificities and requirements. Um, so it's important that you check the award description for the particular country you're interested in to make sure that you are eligible. Kind of the go-to answer to most questions with Fulbright, since it is such a vast program and has so many different things, um, is that the answer to your question is going to depend on where you apply. It's just going to depend. Um, but that's one of the reasons um, why I'm here, is to help guide you through that process and to answer those, those questions as they come up as we get into the weeds of this. So what are Fulbright grants? So they, they kind of fall into, actually before, before I go on to that, um, 
Rebecca, do we have any questions regarding anything I've talked about so far? Not yet. No questions yet. All right. Well, if you do have any questions about eligibility, please let me know. Um, I'd be happy to answer those. Just because we've moved on from eligibility doesn't mean you can't ask them anymore. Okay, so two different types of awards. We have the study research grant, which is one blanket of award, one broad category of award. And then we have English teaching assistantships. Now the study research awards, um, there's 950 plus awards. They last roughly eight to 10 months. Both, uh, most all Fulbrights are a full academic year. They go to around 140 countries, so there's a lot more options under the study research umbrella. And this is for people who want to do independent research abroad, study, or do an art project abroad. Um, this is kind of how Fulbright started, was to be a, a study research oriented program. Um, but in recent years, the English teaching assistantship, the other arm of this, and from, from here on out, I'm probably going to refer to this as ETAs, it's the common abbreviation for it. Um, these types of awards have gained a lot of traction over the last few years. Um, and each year we have more and more um, awards being offered and the countries keep expanding and expanding. So there's um, 1,250 different awards. They're also for a full academic year. There's a few less country, but a lot more awards available. And in the past, Auburn has had a lot of success, um, specifically with English teaching assistantships. A lot of students do apply for English teaching assistantships that have applied through Auburn. Um, and the basics of that award is that you would go abroad to help teach English and US culture in different classrooms abroad. So a little bit more about the study research. So it's not study or research, and it's not necessarily study or research. It could certainly be both. Um, the bottom line is that you're putting together some individually designed either academic projects where you would go and complete graduate study abroad or a research project abroad or some combination of the two. You could complete graduate coursework, even in some cases earn a master's degree on a Fulbright. You could also conduct research abroad with um, a faculty member that you connect with. Um, or get some sort of professional training in performance arts, for example. Um, the specific guidelines for what these sorts of awards are, need, you need to check this specific award description to make sure, but in general, they're kind of like a choose your own adventure. Um, you get to decide where you'll be, you get to decide what university you would attend or what nonprofit organization you might work for, and you would decide what that project would, ent would entail. So you have a lot more latitude to control the aspects of your proposal, which in my mind actually makes writing the grant a lot easier. One thing that does make the study research awards a lot harder is that you do have to do a lot of the groundwork for getting the project together. So Fulbright does not set up mentors for students. Fulbright does not necessarily set up graduate programs for students. So whether you're studying or you're doing research, you're gonna to have to affiliate with some sort of organization abroad or some sort of university abroad. Um, if you were to apply to a Fulbright to get your master's degree, um, you would have to apply for Fulbright and then concurrently also apply for that master's program. And you'd have to be accepted to both in order to do that experience. Fulbright doesn't get you into a master's program. Fulbright is a way to fund that master's program. Um, but the letter of affiliation is basically just you proving that you have been accepted or that um, a faculty member or a mentor abroad is willing to sponsor you through, through, this, um, through this grant. Um, and they are definitely required for study research awards. Do I have any questions yet? Or am I doing okay? Not yet. Okay. So then the other, like I said, the other large blanket um, group of awards are the English teaching assistantships. So in this case, you would apply to a single country, you would apply as an English teaching assistant, um, and then you would be placed by the Fulbright organization in that host country to teach in a particular school within a particular part of that country. So you'd assist local teachers in some scenarios. In certain countries, you actually have a lot of latitude to control that classroom and actually be the teacher of that classroom. Again, it just depends. Um, you're also supposed to serve as the cultural ambassador for the US, um, but the catch is that every country is looking for differently qualified people to serve different populations. So once again, choosing the country, choosing where you go is kind of the most important part of a Fulbright, choosing a Fulbright grant. 
Um, and there are lots of spe specifics on the web page. I'm going to show you how to navigate those in just a few moments and show you kind of what that web page looks like and kind of how you might go about getting more information. Um, one thing I want to break up at this point is that there is not necessarily a language requirement for Fulbright. A lot there, there is a misconception sometimes that you have to speak a foreign language to be um, eligible for a Fulbright. That is not the case. There are lots of awards uh, that have no sort of uh, language requirement outside of English. You do have to be able to speak English fluently regardless of where you go, um, but some countries don't have any other language requirements. Um, and they just vary depending on what, what, um, what country you want to go to. So that's the, again, high level pitch of English teaching assistantships. Are we still okay? Any questions? Not yet. Okay, all right. So then on to the benefits of, um, of receiving a Fulbright grant. So pre-grant and in-country benefits are gonna kind of vary by the country you go to, but all of them include a round trip airfare to get you to the country and get you home at the end of your grant. There'll be a monthly stipend to help um, cover the cost of living while you're there and to cover the cost of room and board while you're there. Um, there is some insurance benefits uh, that also go along with, with the, the grant while you're in the country. Um, and then there are a host of other possible benefits. So support for dependents. Sometimes there's a research allowance for study research awards. Sometimes there's a tuition allowance uh, depending on the program. Um, but that will vary by country. Um, I remember last year I was speaking with a Fulbright alum and she was talking about how she decided which Fulbright grant she wanted to pursue and she had a small child. Um, and so she basically did her entire search based on whether or not the Fulbright grant would support dependents. Um, so it is one potential benefit, but it's not across all countries. So if things like um, that are important to you, make sure that you're reading carefully the award description, choosing the grant that's gonna fit your needs best. In terms of the post-grant uh, benefits, um, you will be connected with a network of alumni. You will, in essence, be a Fulbright alumni. And um, through that, you'll be able to meet um, many people that will be able to help you in your career, connect you to job opportunities, and connect you to other possible grants and different things um, that being a part of that uh, association comes along with it. Um, you'll also have 12 months of non-competitive eligibility hiring status within the federal government. Um, so if you are already planning to work for the federal government, this can be, this could be incredibly um, useful for, for you in that you will be at a competitive advantage um, against people without such status um, once you finish your grant. So for 12 months after your grant, you would qualify for that NEC hiring status, which is really, really cool with, for jobs within the federal government. Now, for the sake of this information session, I don't wanna get into the weeds of the particular application components, but I do wanna real quick um, address what the different components are so you get an idea of how involved this application process will be. So you'll have some basic information that you have to fill out and then a series of essays, short essays um, to fill out. One of them involves your uh, cultural engagement plan. So how will you fold into the community? How will you engage with the culture that you are um, that you are immersed in as a Fulbright student? Um, you'll have to write a response to how what you will do upon returning from your Fulbright. So what are your plans? How does Fulbright fit into your future goals and will fit into your future goals? You also have to write an abstract as a part of that. And then the major writing sections are these two essays, the statement of grant purpose and the personal statement. So they differ in length for the research study grant you're gonna have two pages to do a, basically a full research proposal where you would outline what your hypothesis is, how you will address that uh, research question and the different methods and the timeline that you, will, um, that you will use for that. And you have two pages for that. For ETAs, their statement of grant purpose has to revolve around what sort of pedagogical techniques you will use in the classroom, what have you used um, in the past and how has that worked? So really capitalizing on the teaching experiences you have had and relating those to what that particular award description wants. I, I like to think of those awards descriptions kind of like a, um, a job description and then these statement of grant purposes to almost be like a cover letter to suggest how 
uh, you'll be able to best fit that, that, um, that job that you're going to do. Um, again, I, I do think that the research study awards are a little bit easier to write these statements for because you know, you would know if you've done all the setup for it, um, where you would go and who you'd be working with. Whereas the ETAs, they only get to choose a country and country specificity in these, um, in these essays are immensely important. And by that, I mean being able to specify why you've chosen a particular country to go to, why this is important for your future, why going abroad to get a master's is um, the best thing for you. Why can't you just do it here? Why can't, why uh, do you need this specific experience in this specific place? Um, and then the personal statement, all grants get one page maximum to do a personal statement. And we're actually gonna have a lot of resources over the summer to help you um, fledge these out and um, craft a really uh, unique and interesting personal statement that describes who you are and shows the unique you on the page. Um, now, personal statements tend to be like a, um, like an intellectual bibliography or a, an intellectual biography where you describe how you got from where you were to where you are currently and then how does Fulbright sort of tie into that whole um, trajectory of your career goals and and your career prospects and your in your interests. Um, you'll also have to do a language evaluation so yeah no um, foreign language skills are not needed for all awards, but regardless, you do have to do a foreign language evaluation of sorts. If no foreign language experience is needed for your award, it'll be a self-evaluation where you can talk about how you plan to gain some experience with this language before embarking on your grant. If the language is required, though, you'll need to do a formal foreign language evaluation um, with a professor on campus. The good news is, though, is that you can choose who you want to do your foreign language evaluation. It could be, for example, if you're planning to go to a country that speaks Spanish and you have experience with Spanish, you could connect with a Spanish teacher and ask them to do um, this evaluation. And basically, it's a series of questions that um, they evaluate you on. Basically, how well do you read, speak, write, and listen to the language? And you'd be rated from a novice in that to a master in that. Um, and the award descriptions specify how much language experience they want you to have specifically. You'll also need three letters of reference. So you, these will need to be professional references. And I always advise students to find individuals that can capture um, three different aspects of, of who they are, if they're a researcher and a student and um, a professional athlete, say, find people that can capture those three aspects of you. The last thing you want in references is to have three individuals that are basically going to say the same thing about you in each reference letter. Um, and the worst case scenario would be if each of those people would say, the student came to class every day, the student made an A. You're really looking for uh, references from individuals who have some sort of a personal connection with you and can elaborate on what makes you a good Fulbright candidate. Um, you'll also need a transcript. You'll need, we'll put together a campus committee evaluation. I'll talk a bit more about that later on. And then there are a few other documents you need like the affiliation letters that I've already talked about. And if you're doing an arts, um, an arts project, you'll have to submit a um, portfolio of, of material of work that you've done. Um, those are the basic application components. Do we still have no questions? No, not yet. Okay. Feel free to, um, to fill in those questions if, if they come up, but I'm just gonna keep on going. Hopefully this means I'm, I'm explaining things all right. So all of those um, elements of your application should come together to present a, um, a proposal that um, is feasible and is um, really captures the, the Fulbright goals. And so the different things that Fulbright is looking for in, in quality candidates are strong proposals, both a really strong academic and professional record, um, they're also looking for personal qualifications, so ways in which you can demonstrate that adaptability and flexibility that makes for a strong Fulbright candidate, someone that can um, go abroad for eight to 10 months and, and be able to um, thrive in that sort of scenario. Um, of course, they're also gonna want to see that you have properly prepared um, the foreign language 
Um, even if it's not required, it's always recommended to um, set up a scenario where you are mastering the language a little bit on your own. You may be taking private lessons or, um, or you are taking a class for the first time or you're using one of the many different apps or software to try to teach the language to yourself a little bit. So making sure that you have done some sort of language preparation because it's kind of silly to think that you would spend 10 months abroad without knowing any other language than English and that would be okay. Um, so they're definitely looking for people that are prepared for this specific scenario. Um, and then there's a lot of things that you don't have a lot of handle over like the preference factors that are established by the FFSB. Um, these change a little bit year to year, but they're usually things like veteran status gets um, preferred, get preferred consideration. Um, they also, depending on the country, are interested in either a lot of um, um, some, some extended experience abroad, especially if you've done study abroad, because it shows adapti uh, adaptable, adaptability and flexibility. Um, but in other cases, some awards are looking to um, send students that have never been abroad. So in some cases, more experience abroad um, doesn't actually help you, it can actually um, hinder you. Um, well, maybe hinder is the wrong word. It's more of if two applications were both equal in terms of content and feasibility and quality, um, but one student had no experience abroad and the other student had a lot of experience abroad, they, uh, the, the student with less experience abroad would get a slight competitive advantage over the student that has an abundance experience abroad. Fulbright does wanna send students um, on these on these sorts of grants to to sort of experience the world in a way that they may never have the opportunity to again and haven't had the opportunity to yet. So um, just depending on the award, experience abroad can be one of those um, one of those factors that swings the application in both directions. Um, they definitely want you to emphasize um, why your project fits well with the Fulbright goals of mutual understanding. So even if you are putting together a research proposal, you still have to address this problem of how does this project benefit um, the US relations with that other country? How does it connect and create that exchange? Um, and then there also are, of course, like I've said for almost every slide, an abundance of different requirements for the individual countries that vary. Um, and they also put a strong emphasis on diversity in, in um, Fulbright applications. So this can be the traditional things that we think of with diversity, like age and ethnic backgrounds and different disabilities, both visible and not visible, um, people from LGBTQ communities, um, people from all walks of life, they want to apply to this, but it doesn't have to just be those sorts of um, markers of diversity. They also want just every type of um, American from every sort of walk of life. They under, the, the Fulbright organization knows that, Amer that the American experience is very different for a wide variety of people. And so um, in your applications, um, one thing to consider is what is your unique slice of Americana? What makes you a unique American? And to be able to um, demonstrate that on the page in your application. One other thing I do want to say about factors in selection, if you have a less than stellar GPA or if you have um, a less, um, less than abundance of, of teaching experience, say, um, I still think you should strongly consider applying if this award, if this grant seems like a good opportunity for you. Um, I can say from experience of sitting in on the National Screening Committee's deliberations back last September for this award year, um, they really look at these applications as holistic applications. They don't really um, stress on one particular part in an application, like GPA, for example. Um, they, I, I sat through their entire deliberation process, and what could have been easy for them to do would be to sort all the applicants by GPA and select the top however many they were looking for, but they never did that. In fact, GPA never came up in the discussion. So they really are looking at the holistic application and making sure that it fits with the Fulbright mission, that it's well thought out, that it's a quality proposal, and that it's feasible, and that it can be done in the amount of time and with the resources that are available. Um, letters of affiliation I've kind of already touched on. Um, I just wanna reiterate again, these are only required for study research awards, and they, um, they are, basically just to demonstrate that you have contacted and you've set up rapport with that host um, university 
or host organization that you would be working with as a part of your Fulbright grant. Um, for most of these, this, would, this will take the form of an actual signed letter on institutional letterhead to indicate, say, that faculty member's support. But there are a lot of awards that also are master's degree programs. So in those scenarios, um, you would need to apply to that program and to the Fulbright at the same time, as I've already said. And then your affiliation for one of those awards would basically be your acceptance into the, um, your acceptance into the university uh, that you're applying to go work in. And it just depends. Okay, so now I'm gonna kind of move away from the broad ideas of, of what a Fulbright is and the different elements of a Fulbright application. But I do wanna pause again to see if there are any questions at all about any of this. Not yet. Okay. All right, well, we'll, have, we'll have more time at the end and I'll, I'll pause a couple more times. Um, so this first timeline is sort of my idealized idea of how someone should interact with major scholarship at any point. So whether it's a Fulbright or, or Rhodes or Marshall or a Goldwater, um, you should be thinking about these opportunities well um, ahead of time. And everyone that's on this call right now is doing that because the application deadline for Fulbright is not until October. So good job, you're already um, where you need to be. Um, but I always advise students to really start um, researching their different options at least three to four months before the national deadline. And then two to three months before that deadline, you should be submitting samples of your writing to me, the fellowship advisor, also your major professor, the writing center to review and have basically as many eyes as possible see those early drafts to get feedback. We are gonna have some resources for Fulbright candidates or for Fulbright applicants this summer to sort of facilitate that drafting process. Um, two months out, so right as we're starting the semester for Fulbright, um, you would still wanna be revising those drafts, but we would already have a good solid draft of the entire application. Um, one month before the deadline, I strongly suggest trying to get all of your letters of recommendation. Again, this is idealized. It's probably not going to happen this cleanly, but the letters of recommendation are the one part of the Fulbright process that you have no control over. So getting them as early as possible is the key. And the other key to getting them that early is to communicate now with the sorts of people that might be writing you these letters. Go ahead and have a backup or two. If you have three very strong letter writer contenders, have a fourth to, um, to, to be a backup just in case. And go ahead and start communicating that you want to do this with them now so that they can be prepared for it when you formally solicit their letter of recommendation a little bit later on. Um, and then one to two weeks, we always say, you need to have your application complete and ready to submit. Now, most students want to play with it and tinker with it up until the final moments before the deadline, which is gonna be October 13th at 5 p.m. Eastern. I highly advise against waiting until the day of to submit your application. And the reason for that is, is because it's all online. It's all done online nowadays. Um, and since it's done online, the servers get horribly backed up near the deadline. Um, and Fulbright is a very compassionate organization, but they have absolutely no compassion with people who submit their applications late. You have from the application opened in March 31st until October 13th at 5 p.m. Eastern. If you can't get it in at that time, they don't care what technical issues you've had, um, personal issues you've had. So I always advise students to be ready days, not hours, but days before the final submission. Um, just to make sure that you can actually hit submit when you want to. Okay, so more specific to Fulbright, I've already stated this, but the application did open on March 31st, and it is going to close on October 13th, 2020 at 5 p.m. Eastern time. So if you are in Auburn like I am, that would be 4 p.m. Central. Um, this has recently changed. Earlier uh, this month, um, they were actually uh, at, the end of, at the end of March, right before the application opened, um, they stated that October 6th was going to be the deadline, but they've actually moved it back. Considering all the things going on in the world right now, they wanted to give Fulbright applicants at least another week to get everything together. And so now the official national deadline is October 13th, 2020. Um, and there's no reason you should expect for, for that to push back any further. That is the hard deadline. 
Now, I know a lot of seniors are going to be um, interested in a lot of different opportunities. Um, so knowing whether or not you've been selected to spend a year abroad is really important. So I wanted to give you some indication of when you might start to hear back about this grant if you submit in the fall. So semifinalists are normally notified in January of 2020 or, or in January, in late January. Um, so this would be January of 2021. And uh, what a semifinalist is, is basically you've made it past the first round of applications. So we have an entire national screening committee that looks at all the Fulbright applications and they cut that application, that uh, they, they do a series of cuts to then send um, their best possible applicants to the in-country selection committee that then starts the review process over again with what the National Screening Committee sends them. So the National Screening Committee selects semifinalists at the end of January, and then the in-country um, committees select their finalists in early April. Um, and I have a little asterisk there because it's not early April for all countries, it's on a rolling basis. So for this year's application cycle, we started to hear about, um, about countries reporting as early as February, at the end of February, and it could go as far as June, but Fulbright does say that for 99% of their countries, um, they expect to know who all of the finalists, the selected students will be, um, in by early April of 2021. So if you are waiting to make decisions about graduate school or a job or anything like that, um, you would likely know your final position in this um, by April of, of next year, which should give you enough time to decide. I will also take a moment to say that if you are planning to go to graduate school and you apply to Fulbright as well, um, many graduate schools know about Fulbright. It's a very popular um, and prestigious award, and they're usually more than happy to defer your enrollment in that graduate school so that you can go on a Fulbright experience. Fulbright is not deferrable, so you either take it or you leave it. Um, but a lot of graduate sc uh, schools would be very happy to have a Fulbright, um, a selected Fulbright student um, come to do graduate school with them after that experience. And they're usually more than willing to let you defer that enrollment. Okay. Now we have, uh, I, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Auburn's timeline and different deadlines. Okay. So the first deadline is coming up very quickly. It is just your decision to apply. And that is going to be due by May 1st. Um, I don't want to stress anyone out um, uh, because I know this is a very stressful time and this is going to be right around exams finishing up and all of that. I'm not looking for a proposal. I'm not looking for anything formal other than you send me an email and state very plainly that, I that you would like to apply for Fulbright this year. Um, after that May 1st deadline, I'm going to get together my list of students and um, have the Big EO Center create us a Canvas page that we'll be able to um, do a lot of the Fulbright support through. Um, and I will need that uh, list of students as early as possible to get that together. Um, if you do miss this deadline, you decide May 5th that you want to apply, please still talk to me. It's totally fine. We can definitely work you in, but I would really like as many students as possible that are interested in this opportunity to make that decision by May 1st. Um, I think I saw a question pop up. I can't read it. I can just see that one popped up. Yeah, so it says, what if you're considering applying for other scholarships and or other gap year abroad experiences such as Peace Corps? Absolutely. Yeah, and this happens all the time. Um, I still encourage you to apply to all of them, right? Um, and there isn't, there, there aren't any programs that I can think of where um, you applying to Fulbright doesn't allow you to then be eligible to apply for something else. And in some cases, you would be able to do both if you got selected for both. Um, just for example, um, uh, we just found out about the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowships. There are situations where students will be selected for that, which is a graduate grant to carry you through graduate school, in addition to being selected for a Fulbright. And in a lot of senses, in, in a lot of senses, it does take a little bit of administrative work, but you can do both. It's possible to do both. Um, at this point, at the application stage, I definitely would say apply to as many things as you can especially if two opportunities are going to satisfy your goals in similar ways. So for example, if you really want to go to Spain on a Fulbright, we could find other scholarship fellowship opportunities that would also take you to Spain for a year. Um, Fulbright is a very competitive award. Um, it's open to everybody, but it's, it's very competitive. Um, so I always recommend 
sort of coming up with an idea of what you want to do in this period um, and put as many, put, put those eggs in as many baskets as possible, Fulbright being one of them. Does that answer the question? I hope so. Please let me know if I need to clarify more. Um, so then in June 1st, I'm gonna ask that everyone uh, commit to a specific award in a specific country. I'm gonna show you how you might go about searching that in just a moment. Um, then throughout the summer, like I've said already, we're gonna have resources to help you draft the personal statement and the statement of grand purpose and the other elements of that. We're gonna have deadlines throughout the summer from late June throughout July to get all of those pieces to me, to evaluate them, to give you feedback so that we're, we're putting together the best possible application we can. Um, all of the support is with the goal of having your entire application, at least a good rough draft of your application completed by our campus deadline, which is going to be August 17th, 2020, which is the first day of the fall semester. And so by a good rough draft, all I mean is that all of the sections are complete and you are happy with those sections for now. We're still gonna tweak them. We're still gonna work on them to make them better but they just all need to be complete. The main purpose for this deadline has to do with the campus committee interview because after this campus deadline, I'm gonna take all the, all the application materials, send them to the committee for review. Um, and then we'll set up the campus interviews, which I hope will be in early September. Um, I'm gonna talk specifics about what that campus interview is in just a moment. Um, and then finally, we will finish your applications throughout September so that we are ready to submit at that national deadline of October 13th. Um, I've, I've laid it out this way to make sure that everyone has ample time to provide writing samples and get feedback in a variety of different ways so that by um, the fall when I'm sure everything gets really stressful uh, with classes starting up again, um, and figuring out your new schedule and, and this and that, that you at least already have a really good handle on your Fulbright application. So we have things in place to make sure that you're supported over the summer to make sure that application gets completed very well. So at the start of the semester, you're ready to go. You're, you're just about finished with this, with this thing. So I've, I've touched on the campus committee interview a few times. Um, it is required for all applicants to participate in a campus committee interview. Um, I'll, I will select a committee uh, of four to five um, Auburn faculty that have experience in abroad, have experience with Fulbright, have experience with a variety of different things that make them good at evaluating Fulbright applications. Um, and they will review your applications and then we will do an interview on campus or if, if the worst is going on and we are still on remote, we would do this interview via Zoom, something like this, and each student would be interviewed on campus um, for roughly 15 minutes, 15 to 30 minutes. Um, it's a time for you to have an open discussion about your project with the committee, um, and they're there to provide feedback about your application uh, materials and to evaluate um, how, how um, feasible your project is and where we can make improvements. I wanna make it clear that the campus committee interview is not a gate that you have to get through. It's not a weeding out process and we won't rank any of our students through this. Um, in terms of your application, it's necessary to basically check a box and say that Auburn does endorse your application. Um, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily not to be, um, to, it, it, it's necessarily be taken lightly. It is informal, um, but it's not something as intense as the outcome of this interview will determine whether or not you apply. Regardless of the outcome of the interview, everyone that submits an application can still apply even after the interview. And just for the record, the only reason we would not endorse a student has nothing to do with your academic record, has nothing to do with how good we think your proposal is. It's mostly how we feel about you as a person, whether or not we feel that you would be um, a good Fulbright candidate. Are you someone who will be able to stick it out for eight to 10 months? Do you have that level of maturity and flexibility? Are you culturally sensitive or do you come into the interview saying some things that we definitely think would be inappropriate if said in the host country? Um, so as long as you're presenting your best self in these situations, your proposal doesn't have to be perfect, you don't have to be perfect, and we wouldn't take you out of the running unless there were serious concerns about um, you as an ambassador for the U.S. through the Fulbright program. Um, the other part of it is literally just to give you feedback. So last year, um, we got some excellent feedback from all of the faculty members on all of our 
applications. Um, and we were able to implement that feedback uh, before the national deadline and it improved all the applications as a result. So you definitely have to participate in this and it's definitely something that will, um, that will benefit your application in the long run. Okay, so resources throughout the process. I've said a little bit about this, but I wanna be even more specific. The resources you have on and off campus are as follows. First, me. I am your fellowship advisor for, um, for Fulbright. Um, please, if you have any questions about a specific award, if you have any questions about anything, please let me know. I'm the main point of contact for Fulbright for Auburn's campus. Um, now that said, I, I will say that I, um, I don't have all the answers. I can't have all the answers for Fulbright. There's just too many possible awards, but I can put you in touch with the right person or I can ask a, a Fulbright representative that deals with your specific country that can give us more information. Bottom line is I'm here to help. I'm here to field your questions. I'm here to um, talk to you if you're getting anxious or, or um, or worried about your application and provide some support in that way. Um, we've also partnered with the Miller Writing Center to um, put on several different summer webinars. Um, we were already planning to do all of these remote, so the current situation doesn't really affect our plans to do any of that. We're gonna have several different webinars, some, one pitched at uh, personal statement writing, one pitched at the, um, the research, the not the research, the, um, the statement of grant purpose, um, and then we're, intermittent with those will be some online peer review sessions where you'll be able to um, give feedback to your classmates and vice versa to benefit your, your overall proposal. My thinking of it is, is that if you start to look at other applications like a reviewer, you will look at your application like a reviewer and improve it as well. Um, like I've said before, we're going to set up a campus page. This is going to be a place where we can run those information sessions. It'll be a place where I can post information about the different Fulbright opportunities and different things that I find out about as, as we move through the application process. Um, you'll also be able to exchange ideas with other applicants and talk to other people that are applying to the same grant as you or different grants than you to, to um, mutually benefit all around. Um, and it'll be a place where we can have an open discussion about, about Fulbright related stuff. Um, the off-campus resource that I want to push, point you to is the Fulbright website. It has a ton of information. So I actually want to pull that up now. So I'm going to come out of this. Hopefully everything doesn't get ruined. So this is the Fulbright website. If you search it, you should, um, you should probably search the Fulbright U.S. Student Program. That should take you to the correct page. But it's uh, us.fulbrightonline.org. This is what the homepage looks like. Um, and there are a lot of different resources here to help you find the appropriate grant. Um, I would strongly recommend coming over to About and checking out the Eligibility tab first to make sure you've read all the fine print, make sure you are eligible. But then I would, in, I would advise investigating the types of awards where you can see the different research awards that are available as well as the English teaching awards. Um, if you don't know at all where you wanna go and you just think this might be an interesting, um, interesting thing you think you might be applicable but you just don't know where uh, might be the best place for you and you say don't have any language experience I highly recommend going into the English teaching assistantships whether or not you want to do the English teaching award and look at these different drop down menus where they'll give you a lot of information about um, the country in and of itself so if you are planning to do a teaching award um, this sort of table will tell you a lot of things how many grants they're offering for English teaching assistantships. What kind of placement you'll be in? Will you be in a middle school? Will you be in a high school? Will you be at a university? Um, I highly recommend that you focus your search based on the experiences you've had. So if you do wanna be an English teacher abroad um, and you have experience, say, working in the Miller Writing Center or working at the university level, you'll definitely wanna look for countries that um, have that as a placement time. So you can interact with the same type of population and you can emphasize that in your application. Um, most importantly for everyone that might be applying for Fulbright are the language requirements. And these are pretty ubiquitous across both awards, whether or not they are required or whether they are required. So as you can see, I'm in East Asia Pacific and there are not a lot of language requirements for any of the countries in East Asia Pacific. Um, there's also a lot of undersubscribed countries here. So if you really don't know where you wanna go, this might be a good place to start if you're interested in traveling to this part of the world and being immersed in that sort of culture. Um, another place to start your search is through the countries page. So everything you can see that has color to it is going to be a, uh, is going to be a country that Fulbright goes to. So basically just not the US, some parts of Africa, some parts of the Middle East and Asia. 
Uh, otherwise, pretty much everywhere else uh, Fulbright goes to or has gone to before. Um, depending on specific travel advisories, this might limit the list a little bit more, but this website will stay up to date with all of those um, as we move forward through the competition. So if you're really interested in, say, going to Spain, you really want to go to Spain, um, if you click on the country, it will then show you the different opportunities that are there. So some of these are things that I've already talked about, like the Open Study Research Awards. Um, these are those plan, uh, choose your own adventure type awards where you get to propose a project. Um, and then there's 160 uh, English teaching assistantships. But then all of these other ones are different, what we would call named awards, where they're, they are Fulbright, but they're more specifically geared at uh, a particular population or group of students that want to take graduate courses abroad or get their master's. So for example, um, this one is at the IE Business um, School, and it's a, it's a one-year master's program where you would actually um, receive a master's um, at the end of, of completing your Fulbright. Okay, so there's a lot of those options as well. If you are interested in studying, but you have no idea where you want to go, I would say go back to about and come down to types of awards and specifically look at these study research awards. So in here, it'll tell you a lot of the specific award opportunities, but then it has this great drop down menu here where it shows all the different countries that do graduate degrees. Um, as a part of, of the Fulbright program, okay? So some of these are gonna be named awards, some of these are going to be um, open study research awards, but all of the countries on this list have a um, degree program where you can leave, finish your Fulbright experience with a degree in the field that you study. And if you choose one of these, so say Spain, you can go in here and see what the specific options are. Okay, another thing that's really useful on the Fulbright website is this alumni page, specifically the alumni ambassadors. So that first um, video that I showed you, all of those individuals are alumni ambassadors. They're excited to tell you all about their experience. And I highly recommend going through this list of different ambassadors from the different years and finding someone who's applying to the same award that you are and solicit inf information about that from them. Um, if you're planning to do a study research somewhere, ask them how they went about connecting with uh, a faculty member abroad or an organization to work with. If you're planning on doing an English teaching award, try to find someone that's done one either in your country or in, in the country you'll be applying to or in a different country, but with similar pr parameters and see if they can provide any more information. Um, no one's gonna have more information about what a particular experience is like, like the people who are actually on that experience. And these that are, have been registered as um, alumni ambassadors, they are um, excited to tell you everything that they can about uh, what, a, what their Fulbright experience was about. So I highly recommend going there and checking it out. All right, let me come back to this. Do we have any questions yet? No. Okay. Um, I have one more video for us and then we'll open it again to questions. I always believed that I had a story to tell. This program was going to allow me to do that. I actually never thought in a million years I would get it. I had a lot of doubts. Am I good enough? Will I be able to complete this grant? Will I be accepted? I think I've met other people that came from I always believed that I had a story to tell. This program was going to allow me to do that. I actually never thought in a million years I would get it. I had a lot of doubts. Am I good enough? Will I be able to complete? This grant, will I be accepted? I think I've met other people that came from a community college, people who come from all sorts of backgrounds that said, I never really thought that people like me ever applied for a Fulbright. Doesn't matter if you're a person of color, first generation, don't have a 4.0 GPA, you should apply for Fulbright. I just want you to hear it for yourself that this could be you. You will absolutely be an awesome applicant. You just have to try.
Once I started applying, I just felt like there's no other option. I wanted it so badly. I went in with a lot of hesitation, and I'm so glad that I didn't let my own self-doubt stop me from applying. We have a limited time on Earth. A big part of being human is traveling and trying to understand and connect and study. Where is she? Oh, there she is. <laughs> so for a student who really wants to get a different impression of their life, I'd encourage them to think about Fulbright. What you got to lose? If I get it, I'm good. If I don't get it, I'm good. But when I got it, I freaked out. <laughs> I was able to get the Fulbright. I never thought this was possible, and it's completely changed my life. I ran and told everybody I knew, like, I'm on my way. I want to apologize for the little bit of um, technical issues there. It's hard streaming um, video across the PowerPoint, across the Zoom. But um, that sort of ends the, um, the presentation here today. So um, I, I, I would like to stay on for a little bit to take questions. But the last thing I'm going to say is that what's the next step? You might be wondering, what is the next step? Well, the next step is to contact me as soon as possible, even if you're still unsure as to whether or not you want to apply. Um, please contact me. I'd love to meet with you um, via Zoom and, and talk about your different opportunities and the different, um, the different goals that you have and, and how maybe Fulbright is the right opportunity for you. Um, if Fulbright's not, and there may be other opportunities that I can help connect you with. So please, that would be the first next step is to contact me directly. Um, you can see my email on the page there and I will be uh, touching base with everyone shortly who signed in today. Um, but that concludes the, the presentation here. Um, do we have any questions now? I'm so not sorry. yet. Did no you? questions. Okay. Um, let's see. Everything's all good. All right. Great. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Like I've said previously, I hope this was informative, but please, um, please let me know if you do have any questions, anything that comes up. Um, I'd be more than happy to, to guide you through this process. Um, thank you so much for, for, um, for being a part of the information session today, and I look forward to hearing from you.